The views expressed on this show by guests and the host on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Free Fall. We're going to have Ted Walter back tonight. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, he's a regular on the show because he works here. He's a director of strategy and development. He holds a master's of public policy degree from the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Prior to his current role with AE 9-11 Truth, he was director of NYC CAN's 2014 Highway Safety Initiative. Uh, volunteer campaign manager for AE's uh, Rethink 9-11 campaign back in 2013 and director of NYC CAN's 2009 ballot initiative. Uh, he's the lead author of the booklet Beyond Misinformation, What Science Says About the Destruction of World Trade Center Buildings 1, 2, and 7, as well as AE's World Trade Center Physics publication and the request for correction to NIST World Trade Center 7 report, which uh, will be a topic of conversation tonight, among other things. Uh, but first, we got some other things to talk about before that. So let's bring Ted on in here. Hey, Ted, welcome back to 9-11 Free Fall. Thanks, Andy. Good to be on. How are you doing? I've, I'm good. I've almost got your bio memorized now. I don't even need to read it, I don't think, anymore. How many, times, John, some... how many times do you think it's been? Maybe 15 or 20? I, your LinkedIn is pasted in my brain right now, I think, so... I know everything about you, and I think our audience is starting to learn a lot about you, too, because you do a lot of stuff here, and uh, you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes and all the great stuff that we follow here at AE911 Truth. Uh, Ted is is part of and uh, helping out with and, and leading in many cases. So well, let's just get to it here, because I'm bringing you on tonight to talk about all these other things, give updates, but we got a, a new project going on. I'm going to let you announce it and sit back. Sure. Well, folks might have heard by now that AE 911 Truth is working on another book uh, similar to the books that we released uh, a few years ago, Beyond Misinformation, World Trade Center Physics. This one is called Debunking Popular Mechanics. And uh, it's probably going to be a similar uh, length where, where we're ending up to what Beyond Misinformation was, 50 to 70 pages. So it's not like a big book. Um, but the, the idea here is, uh, you know, as 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 many people will know, we started uh, earlier this year working on a film that was going after, you know, de debunking the idea that controlled demolition had been debunked. And as we started working on that film, we 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 were uh, giving a lot of attention to popular mechanics, reading, you know, going diving back into that book that was the latest edition was published back in 2011. And and we said, geez, when you when you go and read this, you really see when you actually look at it for yourself, you see you can see just how deceptive it is and just how false it is. And it jumps off the page, really. And, you know, I've read David Ray Griffin's debunking 9-11 debunking. A, you know, the truth also has a series critiquing the 2011 popular mechanics book, um, you know, debunking 9-11 myths. But it just those works as good as they are, don't quite do it justice when you look at it for yourself. And so, so we started to develop this idea of a, of a new book, not only to go along with the film, sort of, where we're going to page by page debunk every single claim that Popular Mechanics makes in the 2011 edition of debunking 9/11 myths. So, on one side of the on one side of the spread, on one page, on the left hand side, you're going to see the actual text from Popular Mechanics, and you're going to see all the stuff on the right hand side linking up to what's in Popular Mechanics, explaining how are they misleading you, what are, what are the real facts here. Um, and it's really the reason that this is so important is that, you know, Popular Mechanics published their first book back in 2000, 2006. I think their first article came out in 2005. And ever since then, that has been like the go to piece for the mainstream media, the corporate media to say, hey, look, we, we looked into this and you know what? It's all nonsense. It's all it's all like crackpot science. We've debunked this. And now, like I would say 10 years ago, they didn't necessarily treat it as fact you know, controlled demolition or 9-11 conspiracy theories have been debunked. 
now the mainstream media treats it as fact. Like if you look at the reporting that happens around the, each 9-11 anniversary, especially around the 20th anniversary, it's just it, it's just a, a, a fact like in the court in the corporate media that it's been debunked and and the whole foundation of that really is popular mechanics sometimes they'll also point to nist which is again a bizarre thing to do to cite one side of a dispute or a controversy and say this is the proof that it's been debunked uh but more often they will actually link to popular mechanics to say to, to support their claim that controlled demolition theories have been debunked if they've if they even back that claim up with anything when they do it's typically popular mechanics and so we said we've got to we've got to meet this head on, which which is what we're doing with the film, but we got to do it with a with a book as well. And so every time the the hope is every time you know somebody in the corporate media claims that controlled demolition has been debunked or conspiracy theories have been debunked, and they link to popular mechanics, we have a lot of people go go in the comment section and post a link to debunking popular mechanics. Uh, we're also going to be mailing the book to ten thousand journalists across the U.S. Uh, you know, we've done these types of mailings in the past, um, whether it's engineers, typically engineers and architects or, you know, leaders at the American Society of Civil Engineers. With this, because the media relies so much on popular mechanics, we want the media, 10,000 journalists across the U.S., all the major publications, New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, to see, you know, to have this, this book in front of them, debunking popular mechanics. Is that going to change what they say? Um, you know, maybe the worst offenders won't change their ways, but I think it'll, it will start to erode in even in the corporate media, the sense that, oh, you know, 9-11 conspiracy theories, we, we, we debunked that long ago. So so that's the idea. Um, and, you know, we're we're into it now. And we think that this is going to be a very important publication uh, that will stand the test of time and, um, you know, hopefully lead to some immediate effects in the, in, in the near future as well as you know, get the media talking about this issue again. Yeah, everything that we do has an effect. And I've seen it demonstrated myself. Like when we did the C-SPAN thing, we had a we had my mom call in and uh, call them out for uh, dismissing people who had these questions. The next day they took a question on head on. They did went for about 10 minutes on it. They did. It wasn't a good answer. Obviously, they're still trying to reinforce the official story. But you can tell that it had an effect because of the sequence of events. And things like this have an effect, too. And this is an old book, folks. And I know we're always picking up new people into this movement who may have just come on, I don't know, three years ago or something uh, before the reign of popular mechanics, because that was the centralized authority in the minds of the corporate media and government of what debunked us, they actually sidestepped NIST in many cases and said, oh, no, popular mechanics debunked that. Now, this is a fact. The fact checker for that book went on in the Charles Goyette show and got completely humiliated on that show for citing incorrect information, just outright lying, was actually proven to be a lie. Uh, at the end, just sort of came apart, stumbling and bumbling over himself on there. That is what's telling you your uh, information about September 11th, about the World Trade Center evidence. That is at least for the general public or at least the public that wants to keep this part of uh, the the whole story buried. That is it. So uh, we're going after it now. Now, Ted, I want to bring this up because it is an old book. Right. You know, this came out a long time ago. This was this was what we were fighting when I first joined the 9-11 truth movement. So why the need now here in 2022 to go after popular mechanics and take them on uh, in this debunking project of ours? Yeah. So, I, when, you know, when pop when when the second edition of the popular mechanics book came out in 2011, around the 10th anniversary of 9-11, you know, 89 truth was busy working on experts speak out, you know, busy uh, doing re actual research into, you know, in particular, a lot of the documents that had been released around that time re regarding Building 7, the building documents. So a lot was going on. And, you know, uh, you know, the, the folks uh, involved at that time didn't have the bandwidth to go and, um, you know, look closely at this, except for one series that was published in the year after the book came out. But I think what what's a little surprising is that 10 years later, uh, this book is continuing to do tremendous damage. Uh, and so that, that's the answer to your, your question. Um, the, like the, this, this book is, has had, a, is having a lasting effect. This book is what this book, as well as popular mechanics article is what the media points to when they, uh, claim that controlled demolition has been debunked and it's not going away. 
it is continuing to to do tremendous damage to our cause and uh and so it's time to it's time to confront it you know it's like when, when you look at how this issue is covered now in the media uh and, and the fact that they the media tends to treat it as fact that controlled demolition theories uh, uh the theory of controlled demolition has been debunked um that's that's kind of like to some extent where the battle where the battlefront is at this moment so we we have to go back and attack the very foundation of that claim of that lie and um you know as, as long as it's continuing to do the damage that it does we, we have to stand up to it yeah i mean what's bizarre about it is that when you actually read the popular mechanics book on the part uh, regarding controlled demolition at the world trade center i mean it's actually a lightweight when it comes to debunking it's pretty shoddy work but for some reason i don't know if it's the popular mechanics name whatever this gets held up as the gold standard of debunking these crazy 9 11 people in fact the history channel i think oh god what's his name migs it's been a while since i've dealt with these people I'm trying to think of their names Migs, but yeah Migs, Migs. yeah he was the guy they were interviewing in the history channel hit piece so many years ago where they show him in the nice office and suit and everything. And then they'll interview a truth or in the cameras right in their face. And, you know, so uh, for some reason, this has had some lasting power. I don't know the corporate power of uh, was it Hearst publications or something like that. It owns it. But regardless, we're going to go after it now, and uh, we're going to get this out to every media person to, at the very least, let them know what they're citing is complete trash. And, you know, I've been reading a book. Um, oh, I forgot the title of it now. It's uh, Confessions of a Media Manipulator, talking about how the media operates. And one of, the, one of the key messages in here is how lazy the media is. They're looking to each other. They're looking to the blogs that they're uh, familiar with to parrot that. So all it takes is for, you know, some influential blogs and, and reporters to say a particular thing. And then everybody's just parroting that person. So in some sense, it's not even a big, massive conspiracy. It's just a collective laziness of our journalistic community. Um, so what we have to do is we have to turn around at least one of those big time journalists in some way, shape or form, at least let them know to stop citing this because we can take them on point by point. And that gets to my next question, Ted. Uh, how how thorough is this debunking going to be? Are we going to take a big teacher's red pen over every single word and, and send it back to them all bloody in a metaphorical sense, I mean, but all red um, is going to go page by page, line by line. How are we going to do this? Yeah, well, we, we don't want to get lost in the weeds going after like tiny little things that are not really going to advance our message and our analysis i think you know so uh but there's a lot of recurring themes that you see throughout the the chapters on controlled demolition throughout the entire book but we're only going to be focusing on the chapters on controlled demolition um you know the the cherry picking the the straw man arguments the like holding up like the worst possible uh always i mean just constantly citing these websites that you've never heard of that the name of the website is crazy so you see that you see that recurring throughout are we going to put a red pen under that every single time if that pops up you know maybe maybe not but on you know the, the so we're going to be looking we're going to be calling out their journalistic tactics as well as the factual and scientific um issues and and problems and so there's going to be i would say a predominant focus on you know here here is how Here's here's the actual facts in the cases where they, they might be actually giving they might be giving a little bit like tiny little bit of truth, but it's it's a misleading little fact that, you know, and so here's the full set of facts regarding this particular claim. This is how this is how they're misleading the reader, you know, and this is this is the this is the reality. Um, and, you know, so you're going to, you know, we, we also we want it to be like we want it to feel very easy to read, uh, you know, so we so we don't want it to be a mess of notes here and there and everything uh but we still want it to feel like we're dissecting it you know so like we wanted to f like we're dissecting what they said but but there's still a simplicity and elegance to what is what is on the page um you 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 want it to feel like you know we're not asking people to read just sit there and read a 70 page book like somebody could flip through it you know over five or ten minutes and get a, and still glean a lot from it um because we'll be highlighting the major points you know with sort of like on our side of the page you know bubbles and images um you know with captions and stuff explaining what what's really going on so at the same time you want we don't want to just be like kind of on their coattails 
like you could read what's what the case that we're putting forward. If you just read our side, the right hand side of the page, every single page, you would still get a cohesive uh, and comprehensive uh, presentation of the evidence. Right. Uh, we're, we're not just going to be like, oh, they're wrong about this and they're wrong about this and they're wrong about that. We still want to make a comprehensive, compelling case uh, for controlled demolition in the course of the 30 or 40 pages that are presenting our information and, and, and the evidence of controlled demolition. Does that make sense to answer your question? Yeah, it does. I mean, essentially, you're, you're not just going to be reading a refutation of everything single line by line. There's going to be sort of uh, original content and material in this, but we're going to be taking them on page by page based on what they reference in this. And it's very important to do this, folks, because uh, you got to take on uh, this because it's such a uh, widely cited thing. We talked about that before, but it's also going to increase your knowledge base because you'll be talking to a friend out in some diner over coffee. They'll say, oh, God, that stuff was debunked by popular mechanics. I actually had a family member say that. He couldn't even cite to popular mechanics. He's just like, I saw something on TV that, that debunked all that stuff. I know what you're talking about. Um, but you're going to be able to, uh, you're going to have those debates and then you can go through that book. You're going to show you know that book better than they do if you have not read it already. Again, it's an old book, at least the controlled demolition section of it. And you'll be able to just put that thing to bed in two seconds. So it'll be a great study aid. We're going to get this out to a lot of people. You know what this is reminding me of, Ted? 2015, I first came on the staff. First thing I was put in the middle of was uh, beyond misinformation, more so the distribution aspect of it, getting it out there. I remember many nights not sleeping for 24 hours, gathering all those addresses, a lot of Johnny Cash playing, a lot of a lot of uh, Red Bulls drank, but we got it done. Let's go back to that time, 2015. This is a very similar project. What was the impact of beyond misinformation and... Uh, you know, why was that important to do? And how are we seeing that resonate here even seven years afterwards? Well, I mean, I see Beyond Misinformation being referenced a lot as sort of comprehensively presenting the evidence and then saying which which hypothesis mm -hmm. lines up with the evidence better. Um, and it does that rather succinctly um, and about as comprehensively as you can do in 50 pages. Um, so I, I think that it's a, you know, it's certainly the foundation of much of our work here. And, you know, we, I've heard, heard many stories about people, uh, you know, engineers, architects who signed our petition because they were sitting in a waiting room somewhere. They were sitting in the lobby of uh, some engineering firm waiting for a meeting or something, and they saw it on the table and they picked it up, and started reading it and were like, oh, my, oh, my goodness. Uh, and then ended up signing our petition shortly thereafter. Uh, so, you know, it, and of course we, we mailed it out to 20,000 architects and engineers. Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to measure the results of that. You know, what can you attribute specifically to that? Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, you, there needed to be a comprehensive written document in the movement, uh, and ideally one produced by architects and engineers for 9 truth and beyond misinformation does that. And it's engaging because of all the pictures and stuff. So there's things that it does that you can't do. Uh, with, say, a, a book by David Ray Griffin that's a long book in print and all of that. So doing our part, making something a little shorter and, and more readable, uh, but at the same time comprehensive um, and with an excellent references section and footnote section, but references to all of the, the most important papers that have been uh, published by uh, researchers in the 9-11 Truth Movement over the last 15 to 20 years. So... Yeah, well, you know, publications have had an important role in history, in American history. I mean, common sense was something that really uh, uh, sparked the American Revolution and a lot of people cited. Uh, so uh, print literature and things that inform people uh, changed the world, changed the entire course of history here. And also want the audience to imagine this. Now, you know, we know the world's getting crazier and crazier. I like to think this scenario is too fantastic to uh, to uh, believe could happen. But let's say something happens and uh, we can't do this anymore. Let's say they say that this is uh, something that nonprofits aren't allowed to talk about. Whatever, whatever scenario that we can't exist. We still have these publications circulating around 20 years later. You know, being found in thrift stores, being found in libraries, being found in some grandfather's basement after he dies. And maybe we wake up the guy who will pick up the torch of this and carry it forward those 20 years later. Or maybe that person, he, him or her, 
will be inspired by it, and maybe they'll take up some new issue that's plaguing our world at that time. These have a major impact. You remember if you saw The Watchmen, great movie, spoiler alert, the, the bad guy gets away with the conspiracy, but then they find the journal of the good guy and it leaves the door open that it'll be exposed uh, even after the movie has ended. That will have that effect. So that's why we got to keep on putting out this material, producing as much material as we can through the, um, the books, the movies, uh, documentaries, other kinds of things that we do. We did the comic book. I mean, it's just things that, just different ways to break into the mainstream society, sink this information in people's minds. That's why this is so important and why I'm looking forward to getting this out there. I'm looking forward to reading it, but that's going to be uh, your job to write it. I'm looking forward to getting this onto the desks of all those mainstream media people that keep on repeating this, uh, this uh, meme. So, uh, Ted, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but uh, <laughs> go ahead and just tell our supporters how they can help out with this project the most. Well, yeah. So, I mean, the key thing is to make a donation. Uh, we're asking for a, a, a reasonable donation of $30 uh, that w with that gift, you will help us have the resources that we need to finish this major work and then to mail it to 10,000 journalists. So with your single gift of $30, you're essentially paying for the book to be completed and you're paying to send it. You, you will be personally reaching six uh, journalists that need to see uh, this book. Um, you know, if you have ideas, if you've read Popular Mechanics and there's something that you think is an important uh, point to hit on, uh, please email us. Um, you can just go to our contact us page uh, and, you know, please let us know, like we're, we're all, we're, we're right now in that stage of absorbing all the information we can to make sure we don't leave out any critical, uh, arguments, uh, or, or critiques of, of what popular mechanics wrote. So those are the two key ways to help make a donation of $30 or more. And by the way, I didn't mention that if you do, if you are able to donate at least $30, you will receive your own copy in the mail as well. Um, and that way you have something that, you know, you can put your hands on to share with your friends and family and, and colleagues and so on. Uh, so, and it will be available online too, so that it's easy to share. Um, but, uh, some, having something in, in somebody's hands goes, uh, a lot further than just a PDF. So, um, make that gift of $30 and contact us if you have any thoughts about what is in popular mechanics that we should be critiquing. That's right. I'd rather read something in my hands, a book, rather than my computer screen still, even in this modern age. So as Ted said, consider helping out. I mean, these things, small things done well every day are what win wars for us. Uh, very important work that he is doing. I'm very excited about this because, again, I can't wait to get that out. And also, too, if you want to volunteer and help us look up those addresses, trust me, it is not an easy task chasing all these down. What did you say, 10,000? 10,000, 10, yeah. We do work with a publicist who can provide that information, but um, has good access to good information for uh, reaching journalists. But I will say, if there's a journalist in particular that you think would be open to this or a journalist that you think um, needs to see this because they're uh, a, a bad offender uh, when it comes to 9-11, 9-11 truth, then email us about that as well. Um, in addition to the, the technical critiques of popular mechanics, who should we be sending this, this book to? Let us know. Yeah, that's right. We're not omnipresent. We don't know every single individual out there. And even if it's somebody that's help might be helpful too, that would be good. Uh, realizing that, you know, this publication, Popular Mechanics is a book has been circulating for so long and taken up as an authority. And I remember John McCain wrote the foreword to that. And um, I don't know if we're going to take him on in that or if it's even worth it, but it's just kind of interesting to know that guy was almost president. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to know the, uh, you know, popular mechanics is getting their book debunked here getting page by page critiqued just in the back of your mind getting a little personal here are you hoping for some kind of response for them yeah i've thought about that and certainly we will <laughs> mail copies to them maybe we'll mail extra copies to, to them um i would you know i i would love to see a response they might you know they might um i i wouldn't be surprised if they responded somehow and maybe tried to debunk what we what we say or maybe they feel like hey we've we've already won the war and um we're just gonna let these these guys run around and try to get at us but we're, we think they're not going to get anywhere and if that's their mindset then i think that they're wrong that's right they'll probably do the latter i'm going to say that now we can make a gentleman's bet on it 
but I would love to see them respond, try to come back with some rebuttal. They won't be able to. Um, so when people talk to them, and that's another thing too, to the audience. So once this book is out, I'm talking about the far off future. You see one of these popular mechanics people that was responsible, Migs, uh, Coburn speaking at some event about something, question them about it. Be respectful. Don't start shouting them at them or anything. Cause that doesn't help. Um, but just try to get them on some point or ask them to comment on the book that AE put out debunking their publication. That stuff is incredibly helpful. Just like the, we are change days when they would, uh, question people publicly. I want to see people doing more of that stuff and putting it on video. So uh, please consider helping out. Very exciting project coming up. All right, let's uh, let's move on to some other things. So we also wanted to update our supporters on various matters going on. And in some cases, I may have gotten your comment, and maybe I haven't. But uh, the NIST lawsuit, remind our audience what that was all about, what it is all about, and then give us some updates on what's going on with that. Yeah, so... Um... Let me just add a little bit of a framework that I've been thinking about in, the, in recent months to this whole discussion. Um, on the one hand, as we were just discussing uh, the Debunky Popular Mechanics book and other similar initiatives, we are uh, a lot of our energy goes towards incrementally, you know, educating the public and educating the technical professions about the controlled demolition evidence. Uh, you know, and and we always have to be making gradual progress on that front, you know, because those little those little leaps sometimes will lead to something very big. And it's just a matter of changing the climate, you know, changing the general uh, public awareness of this issue. Uh, on the other side, we also focus on a lot of um, put a lot of energy into strategies that are designed to, like, create big breakthroughs. Um, and, uh, you know, turn things quickly, because I think ultimately we all feel, you know, more than 20 years on from this event that um, the incremental stuff is important, but it's some sort of breakthrough or a series of breakthroughs that is going to turn things around is going to get us to a groundswell of awareness and support for a new investigation. Um, so the NIST lawsuit uh, is a is something that I would maybe put in that second category um, when it comes to these kinds of initiatives. Uh, the, the concept that I've been thinking about is we're we're trying to find uh, we're we're essentially going up directly against the the official cover up the the lie what happened whether it's going up against NIST or going up against a paper that has been published in the um, one of the ASCE journals um, or uh, you could look at the inquest that we're trying to help the, the the family of Jeff Campbell in the UK open as well as we're you know it's not like the government in the UK was involved in the cover-up of what happened on 9-11, but we're trying through that venue as well to directly confront the cover-up by establishing in a court of law in the UK what actually happened, what actually caused the death of Jeff Campbell. Um, we're looking for these checkmates. Um, and there's a scientific there's a scientific checkmate where our argument is our argument is decisive um, if we're going up against somebody, whether it be NIST or an ASCE paper or what have you. Uh, and then there's also procedural checkmates where like the procedure is so well uh, is just very suited to to um, favoring our our initiative and favoring the positive outcome that we're we're shooting for. So when we look at the NIST situation, the, the lawsuit that you asked about and the request for correction, that was the, the, the start of this lawsuit. That is what this lawsuit is about. We have NIST in a scientific checkmate. We've taken their report. Uh, on building seven and methodically in, in a very detailed and carefully sourced way have shown how in eight different ways that their report uh, violates their own information quality standards uh, by either giving us a false story of how the collapse of the building was initiated or by ignoring evidence, direct evidence of control that, that points to controlled demolition. Um, and, and so, but we knew, we knew all along that the process that we were using was, you know, very weak. Um, the, the request for correction process gives a, a, a huge amount of essentially discretion to an agency to, um, if they don't like what you're trying to tell them to, you know, we're, we're telling them to correct their report. And if they don't want to, they're going to find a way not to, right? And that's just the nature of the request for correction process. Uh, that exists under the Data Quality Act. 
And that is what we're fighting now in the courts is we're saying, look, is this Data Quality Act going to have any teeth? Is this request for correction process going to have any teeth or is it going to be or is it actually uh, viable for federal agencies uh, when, you know, constituents, citizens try to get information corrected? Is it easy for these agencies to just, you know, respond with a bunch of nonsense um, and not have to actually correct their the information that they disseminate? So that's kind of what the lawsuit is about right now. Um, we, we submitted this 100 page request for correction in, in the spring of 2020. Uh, NIST re initially responded in late summer of 2020. We appealed their initial decision that was denying our request uh, a month later in September of 2020. Uh, then we had to wait about nine or 10 months for them to finally respond with their final decision. And if you the, the, cr the crux of it is in their initial decision where they give you t these totally like unsubstantive, unscientific, superficial, uh, cursory responses to all of our claims that anybody who reads it can tell, like, that's all you need to know, that they have nothing, that they cannot respond to our arguments is to read what is in, in the, their response to the request for correction. So we filed a lawsuit last September, uh, a little over a year ago, um, essentially claiming that what NIST did in the res its response to request for correction was not a real response, a meaningful response under the Data Quality Act. And where we where we got to was finally a couple months ago, the court, the, the lower court, the D.C. Circuit Court uh, responded and essentially said that uh, essentially attacked our standing. Now we're talking about the organization Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We're talking about uh, eight 9-11 family members. And we're talking about 10 architects and structural engineers three different categories of plaintiffs, which the courts are now saying we, for different reasons, none of us have standing to even bring this lawsuit. Um, that is a, I mean, when you're talking about a report on the collapse of a 47 story building, and you're saying that architects and engineers don't have standing or this organization, architects and engineers, Island truth doesn't have standing. And something that happened on 9-11, you're saying that 9-11 family members don't have standing. Like, I mean, that flies in the face of sort of just a sense of like morality and justice uh, about what what's you know what this issue is. I want to do a larger critique of the of the U.S. legal system, which is that <laughs> this idea that you know what if you read it and we talked about this a couple of months ago, this idea that we don't have a right, we have a right to this information being published because con there is a congressional mandate for it to happen, but we don't have a right for that information to be truthful or reasonable. Right. Like that somehow that right is not enshrined in the law. Um, this I, the, the, the U.S. legal system uh, severely limits the number of rights that are recognized. We get it. So it becomes this entire like uh, technocratic debate about does this right exist or does it not exist? You know, and then if you manage to get a right established, which is very hard to do, uh, then we protect those rights almost too aggressively, I would say. Um, so whereas I think in a more sane legal system, what you would do is recognize more rights, recognize, Hey, there are many interests that people in society have, uh, and, but maybe find, try to balance those rights, right. As opposed to either you have the right or you don't have the right. And if you do happen to have the right, then you're, you, you, that right is somehow absolute. No, it's, it's totally backwards. We should have more rights recognized and then the, the, the legal process should be about finding a, a reasonable balance of those rights. So that's kind of why we find ourselves in this total like legal maze here of technicalities fighting over, do we have a right to information being truthful or not? Of course we should. If, if the, if the, if the government is required, required to publish this report, of course we should have uh, not only the right for that, to that, for that information to exist, but for it to be truthful. And if we have a, uh, a reasonable argument uh, as to why the information is inaccurate or untruthful, the agency should have should be required to provide a substantive response to our claims, and the courts should have should have it in their scope to look at. Well, let's see here: is the what does what the agency said actually address what the complainants originally argued in their request for correction? Uh, so the courts are saying none of that exists. You don't have a right to this information being truthful. Uh, you don't have and you are not a, some you are not affected. Essentially, they're saying you are not adversely affected by 
the false information that this agency has put out. So it's sad. That's where we are. But that's what I said. This is a weak process that we decided to embark on because, hey, there's a chance here and we have to at least give it a try. And we have to carefully document how NIST lied in their report on Building 7. Uh, but all along, this was going to be a challenging process to actually receive that, reach that outcome that we wanted, which was for NIST to actually go back and rewrite its report, run new analyses, you know, with the, the correct information included in their analyses. So that's where we are with the request for correction and the lawsuit. Yeah. Well, to say that we're not affected, I mean, say that when I'm getting my suitcase rifled through by TSA at the airport, and we're all affected by September 11th. Say that to the people who uh, are, are struggling to breathe right now as a result of the towers coming down. Again, it wasn't airplanes that brought that caused these people to be sick. It was the towers coming down, pulverizing into powder uh, in midair and spreading throughout lower Manhattan. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you are elaborating on this legal aspect because I've been thinking about this a lot. And I'm no legal expert by any stretch of the imagination, not even going to pretend that I am. But I know that they talk about slippery slopes, and I, it makes me wonder how bottomless this entire thing goes. Okay, so the, all they have to do is put out a report. It doesn't have to be accurate. I mean, how far can they go with that? Can they just blow their nose in a hanky and hand that to you and say, hey, is your Building 7 report right there? We're done. We're the government. You know, now I would like to hope it's not that ridiculous, but speculating a little as much as you're comfortable with, I mean, how much can agencies like NIST, and again, this is not just about 9-11, this has far-reaching implications, what they're saying here about any agency doing any kind of report on anything that uh, requires investigation, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, whatever, whatever agency, you know, even uh, FBI and whatnot. I mean, this, this should... In my thinking, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know more about the legal system than I do, but does the FBI have to give correct information to the public when it's regarding a case? You know, uh, CIA, when talking about uh, operations overseas, you know, do they have to be held accountable at all? Um, other things, consumer protection, you know, the products that go into, that go into our bodies, we buy them at the store, uh, you know, FDA, do they have to be accurate in their reports on how safe a particular, uh, you know, a chemical that maybe makes up children's formula is? This is bigger than even 9-11, if that's at all possible. But how, you know, how far can this go with this, in your view, speculating just a little bit? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a, I'm not sort of aware of the full range of all of the types of information that the government uh, disseminates and what are the standards that they have to meet in terms of accuracy and truthfulness or what have you. Um, so let me just, you know, that caveat before I, you know, give my answer here. But I mean, I think NIST has pushed the very limit of what an agency can push it to the very limit. So like the only, the only step further that you could go is as you said, blowing your nose in a Kleenex and calling that a report on building seven. Like that is actually how uh, outrageous, let's say, you know, we could focus on one aspect of the, the report that we criticize, which is, you know, some listeners will be familiar with this, the omission of stiffeners at the end of this girder that NIST alleges was pushed off of its seat and, and, there, and then initiated the collapse of this building um, the existence of these stiffeners uh, is known, is a known fact, and this has acknowledged it, that these stiffeners, this structural feature did exist on this girder. And if it had been in NIST's modeling, if it had been included, which NIST admits that they excluded, it would have prevented the very failure that NIST alleges took place. And now through the request for correction, NIST originally had one excuse for omitting the stiffeners. They were, um, they've updated their excuse because of the request for correction uh, to something kind of even more outrageous. I'm not going to get into the details here because it, it, it requires, I don't want to spend the next like five minutes talking about it, but they're, they're, they've essentially, they've essentially said the structural feature that would prevent this failure from occurring is not needed in our analysis, even though it would prevent the failure that we allege uh, took place. That's essentially what they've said in their response to the request for correction. 
like from a scientific standpoint, this is, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's fraud and, and it's unscientific. And if, and, and so what I said, it's one step away from blowing your nose in a, in a Kleenex and calling that a report on building seven. Um, it, it's like any engineer, uh, can look at, can, can look at the, uh, failure that NIST alleges, see if that structural feature were included, that that failure couldn't have occurred, and then look at NIST's response to our criticism and see that NIST is lying. So it's, it's, it's frustrating, and that's what, uh, that's what this is amounting to, as, as you said. Like, essentially, like, uh, federal agencies can, can publish whatever information they want, and it's ultimately up to them, their discretion, the way that this is going. Um, then that's kind of, the, sadly, maybe the precedent that this case might be setting, um, that, that um, federal agencies can publish whatever they want and there's no accountability for it other than political accountability. If there was enough political pressure, um, maybe NIST would have to go back. And ultimately, that's what we're aiming for. Um, but uh, short of um, massive political pressure, there's no pressure on federal agencies at this point to, to publish um, truthful, accurate information. Well, you know, it seems to me, again, I'm no expert on sociology or anything. I'm just a guy shooting his mouth off here. But I'm going to tell you, you know, most Americans, if you take 9-11 out of it and just talk about that precedent that's being set, which we're talking about here, that the government is not required to give you any accurate information, I would think some of them would have a problem with that. And it's a sad thing that when we're talking about judicial issues, accountability from government, that we have to talk about political processes, because the United States of America, you know, people say it's a democracy, but it's actually supposed to be a republic where it's ruled by law. So even if everybody votes against one person's rights, that person still has rights. So, you know, we elect our leaders democratically, but we're still rule by law here, not rule by a majority whim. So if you can bamboozle everybody into supporting something ridiculous, then that that's what uh, goes forward because there's supposed to be bills, a bill of rights and all sorts of laws in place to uh, prevent mob rule from happening. So we shouldn't have to be political about this. I mean, there should be some kind of law uh, on the books where the government doesn't just get away uh, with murder if it wants to. And in, in a sense, with these flawed reports, they have 3,000 people died as a result of what happened at the World Trade Center. Now, Ted, I'm not going to put you on the spot or anything like that. I know there's a lot of thought that goes into these things. I'm just saying, you know, I, I have visions that come to me and I'm just looking in an old history book from the future and I'm seeing uh, Supreme Court case AE 911 Truth versus Nest. I don't know. I see potential there. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Just your thoughts. I would love to see that. Uh, I don't want anybody to get their hopes up about that. Um, you know, if we do lose at the appellate level, which we're we are about to in, in the next couple of weeks, file file the first document that we need to file to uh, start our appeal against the lower court decision. Like we, we are. So we are s starting our appeal shortly. Uh, if we lose that appeal, we will certainly consider whether to appeal to the Supreme Court um, and, you know, you know, the Supreme Court accepts maybe what 0.1% of the cases that, that are that are um, the petitions that they receive. So we'll see. Uh, we, we would we would probably file the appeal and then and then see what happens. Um, I'm not holding my breath for that. Uh, and I don't think anybody else is. And I tend to be more on the more optimistic side uh, than maybe the most of the people, uh, most of the activists in this movement. Um, but uh, but we have to we have to fight to the end, you know, and we have to as long as resources allow, um, you know, put our eggs in, in every every basket that makes makes sense at all. And so this is one of those baskets that we have to uh, to continue pursuing. And like, I, you know, that fortunately through this request for correction process, as I spoke about at our symposium a couple of weeks ago around the anniversary, um, while we may not reach the outcome that we were striving for as far as getting this to go back and run new analyses and correct its report in several respects and essentially acknowledge that the building came down due to controlled demolition, uh, we have succeeded in forcing this to, um, you know, utter more falsehoods and, you know, in increasing the paper trail, uh, of, uh, of, of lies and, um, you know, you'll you'll see that, especially as I spoke about the, the symposium and this um, this uh, new this new excuse for not examining the steel that was recovered from Building Seven and and examined and, and documented in, in the uh, 
a FEMA report of 2002 and Appendix C of the FEMA report, their, their excuse for it is we don't know for sure that that steel came from Building 7. So it would be there's no justification whatsoever to study that steel and to figure out why that sulfidation and intergranular melting occurred. Um, when in fact, every engineer and scientist who studied that piece of steel, and then there's there's many other reasons why it, it most likely came from, from Building 7, everyone agrees that the steel came from Building 7. NIST, NIST new excuse is that, it, is that we don't know for sure that it did, which, you know, these are not like engineers that necessarily agree with us about what happened. These are engineers who maybe supported NIST or were part of the FEMA investigation. They believe it came from Building 7. So um, even if it, even if we don't know for sure, NIST should still study that piece of steel. Like it's still an open mystery, although it's not really, how that sulfidation and intergranular melting occurred. Hasn't been answered. There, there, was, a, there was an article published in 2006 by some of those professors at Worcester Polytechnic Institute where they they actually ran an experiment to try to reproduce that that sulfidation and melting and couldn't do it couldn't do it based on their own hypothesis they subjected the, the steel to high temperatures and a mix of sulfur and uh, some other uh, some other metal for 24 hours and couldn't get any of the uh, melting and sulfidation and they said well maybe it just you have to do it longer it requires longer exposure that's that's the that's that's the case, but they haven't actually reproduced it. And I'm not sure if it wouldn't occur in 24 hours, why would it occur in, you know, 48 hours or 72 hours? And we're talking about extreme temperatures, 1100 degrees Celsius, they subjected it to. How is steel gonna be subjected to 1100 degrees Celsius for a week or two in a pile? It's, it's not, that's totally implausible. So the only viable explanation is, is thermate um, in, in building seven. Here we are. Yeah, well, that's what all the evidence shows. And I mean, we already made the case years ago. We're up against a sociological problem, but more importantly, just a, a deep uh, oh, structure, a structural failure of our entire system is what we're what we're facing. We can use some engineering terms and applying it to law. Uh, I just can't believe that in the America I was told we were that we lived in, that this can be that the government can just be this um just I, I pull off this much obfuscation and can be this uh, stone, do this much kind of stonewalling to uh, to the to its people. And you know what? No accountability. What's sad? What's surprising and sad is that um, is is that there's so many people that that know uh, people in positions of authority or just scientists, engineers. Um, I think what's what's astounding is that so many people know and are just complacent. And like, I guess are okay with it and are just feel that it is, uh, that it's not worth their time to challenge it because the powers that be the, you know, the people that, that brought us 9-11 are just too powerful. And, and that's, that's sad and scary. And that, that, you know, I mean, I'm not, whatever this word means, but to me, that means you, you don't live in a democracy. Um, if something like this can happen and not enough people are willing to stand up and say, wait a second, this, this story doesn't, this story doesn't add up. Because yeah, you know when you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that not enough people stand up because they're scared, or or for their own self, for their own self interest, they're they're not willing to do it. Well, and the sad, but the truth is, when you realize the truth, nobody is too powerful. I don't care how much money you have, or how many guards you have, or whatever. I mean, remember Rocky Four? He cuts the Russian, and he says he's not a machine; he's just a man. That is true. So much in life, none of these people deep down are all that powerful. Anybody can be uh, can be bested and all it just takes is the desire the effort the willingness from people so if you're out there run for congress if you are you know we uh we're a 501c3 we don't get behind any candidates but i'm just saying if you have the inclination in you to go out there and challenge these people even if you lose you get the issue out there and you can influence things so consider doing that next time around now we got a limited time because we spent so much time on this so we're going to just kind of go quick but uh, just a quick update on the uk inquest we heard from matt campbell at the uh forbidden truth event go ahead yeah, yeah well so as a, where i was saying that the nist process the request for correction process is a weak process uh when it comes to the inquest this is a very strong process and we have a in what i would call a procedural checkmate like the this whole and you've heard it for the past year or two this process is designed to make it easy for families to get a new inquest. If there's any evidence, any new evidence that was not considered at the first inquest that 
in any way calls into question what the original conclusion was, or even possibly calls into question the original conclusion, which in this case was that the airplane caused the collapse of the North Tower and therefore caused Jeff Campbell's death. Um, the family is entitled to a new inquest. Um, so uh, also, if there was not a sufficient uh, amount of inquiry into the cause of death, which in this case there wasn't, if you go back and read the transcript from the inquest, they spend no time whatsoever discussing or presenting evidence uh, as to what caused the collapse of the North Tower. And yet in the in the final, what they call the inquisition form, um, it says that that the, the collision of the airplane caused the building's collapse, even though that wasn't actually discussed and, and analyzed during the during the inquest. So we have two separate grounds for opening the new inquest, new evidence and insufficiency of inquiry. We, we easily meet those thresholds. The, the Campbell family easily meets those thresholds. And we will be like, whereas whereas the re request for correction and the, and the NIST lawsuit were, you know, you know, let's say long shots, like the, uh, the odds were against us. The odds are not at all against us with the inquest. Like we will be shocked if the attorney general uh, for England and Wales comes back and says, um, we're not going to grant you the authority um, to uh, seek a new inquest, which is technically what what is what we're dealing with at this stage. Um, the UK Attorney General granting his authority to then apply to the High Court for for a new inquest. Um, we will be shocked, and we we will then fight it. Um, the outcome that should be expected here by everybody in the Nile of Truth community, um, by people in the UK that are following this around the world, people following it. The outcome that is should be expected here is for this new inquest to be granted. And if it's not, it will be a travesty of justice and we will um, we will appeal the attorney general's ruling. Uh, but as of now, we're assuming that they will um, get uh, the green light to uh, apply to the high court for a new inquest. And Good news. Happen within within a few months, because it's been over a year now since they submitted the application. There ha and I will report that there's been a lot more back and forth with the attorney general's office over the past month or so. That is, that is excellent news. And so we're making progress there in the UK. The coroner's co court won't oppose a new inquest. Uh, I don't know. What are they doing right over there that, uh, that uh, we're doing so wrong here in the United States? We're supposed to be the country that was uh, that had the revolution for freedom and, and such. But we're hoping that this goes forward. And then if the UK inquest goes forward and they, they make the ruling the way we want it to, that'll be a hard precedent for uh, the people here on this side of the pond to ignore. All right, let's get to the uh, paper by Tony Zambodi and Richard Johns. Again, there's a lot of back and forth and backstory related to this. Just quickly remind our audience what this is all about and then uh, bring us to where we are with it now. Yeah, so this is another situation where we have a, a scientific checkmate, um, but and we had a procedure that was pretty straightforward, and yet the, the terms of this procedure have been uh, egregiously violated by the people that manage this procedure. So um, there is a paper by a professor named Zdenek Bizant uh, and another professor, now professor named Jialing Lei, that claim that the top of the North Tower, when it starts to go down, the reason that you don't see it slow down and it appears that it's constantly accelerating is because the camera, it, the deceleration was so small that you couldn't pick it up with a with a normal camera. Um, there has to be a deceleration if the top of the tower is going to be crushing the structure below it, it has to observably has to slow down a little bit, but they're saying that the, the deceleration was so small that you wouldn't be able to observe it. So Tony Zambodi and Richard Johns submitted a uh, critique of that uh, within the five months that they were required to uh, essentially showing that Byzant and lay used incorrect values in their analysis uh, for the weight of the upper structure, the, the mass of the upper structure, as well as the, uh, resistance of the structure below, uh, and that if you use the correct values, it actually reverses the outcome of the analysis and shows that there would be a significant deceleration that would have been picked up by that, that could be measured based on video footage. Um, that discussion was first rejected after a year of sitting under review. Uh, Gons and Zambodi appealed it and showed that the rejection was basically unfounded. And then waited for another 14 months and the editors came back and rejected the paper saying that it was out of scope. How can a discussion paper that is critiquing a previously published paper be out of scope for the journal? 
So eventually, after several years, they submitted a, an ethics complaint. Um, this is back in 2018, now four years ago, and eventually got the journal to agree to do a new review of the paper. This happened in the past six months, uh, which was, seemed like a big victory. That was the goal of the ethics complaint, was to get a new review of the paper and hopefully get the paper published. The new, the new editor, his name is Franz Joseph Ulm, the editor of the Journal of Engineering Mechanics under the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, came back and rejected the paper, basically saying, I agree with the, the arguments in the original review. And that was it. He didn't explain why. Um, it's not even clear that he read Zamboni and John's uh, rebuttal of the original reviewer's comments. Um, and the terms of our of the ethics complaint that Zamboni and John submitted was that the paper needed to either be accepted and published or they needed a technically reasoned decision why the paper should not be published that they did not get from the editor, the new editor of the journal. And so they appealed that they appealed his initial rejection and they're still waiting now. It's been over three months. They got the first decision in two weeks, like the, the superficial one that I just described, where he didn't actually explain why he agreed with the original reviewer. Now they, they appealed it and they've been waiting for over three months uh, and still have not received a decision. And they're, you know, they're now like, you know, in communication with the, the ASE journal staff saying, where is this? Why is this review taking so long? Um, typically reviews do happen within three months. So they're still fighting it. And, you know, as long and, and tedious and frustrating as this process has been, I still have hope that this paper will get published because I think that we have them in a checkmate technically. And I think that procedurally that this process is just strong enough that like it may allow for us to get the, um, the just outcome that we have been fighting for for over 10 years now. And get this paper, yeah, well, and the, the let me just say, getting this paper published will really undercut this theory of how this prevailing theory of how uh, within the engineering community of how the twin towers collapsed. So, yeah, well, the more of a checkmate that we get them into scientifically, the longer it takes for them to respond because they got to essentially make something up here. Um, so, this is great work that's being done, folks. This is the work that AE 911 Truth is doing. That's why you got to help us out. Sign up for our email, support us if you can. We're not, you know, we, we have this podcast to bring on interesting guests, but this is not what it's about. What we're doing is the real work that needs to be done. We're going the farthest, and uh, we need the support, though, to keep it going. I want to go all the way to the top, as I was alluding to earlier when we were talking about the NIST request for correction lawsuit. And I want us collectively, and that includes you out there and the viewing audience being part of this, I want us to leave our impact so the world will never forget the 9-11 Truth movement and AE 9-11 Truth and the fact that those buildings were brought down in controlled demolitions. And Ted, I never know how to thank you for all the work you're doing. It's epic. Keep it up, and we're going to keep everybody updated uh, on your work and all the other work that goes on here. And uh, thanks for coming on Freefall today. Thank you, Andy. Really appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's another 9-11 Freefall. I say this every week, but if you have suggestions, ideas how to improve the show, then simply write to us at ae911truth.org. That's the main site, or at 911freefall.com. But for my part, this is Andy Steele saying we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.